Hello there. It's been a while since I posted a Modern Democracy video. Um, and I've been digging deep into the ChatGPT functionality, how ChatGPT works. And I actually have a paid instance of it. So um, I've got access to GPT-4. And as of a few days ago, I've got access to some of the uh, beta features. So in particular, I've got web browsing. Um, hooked up and I can also do plugins. Um, the one I've played the most with is the Wolfram Alpha plugin, but today I wanted to kind of talk a little bit about how to customize ChatGPT to sort of make it more of a collaborative tool. Um, so I've been spending a lot of time just kind of asking all sorts of unusual questions of ChatGPT. Um, just trying to get understanding and gain understanding of exactly what you can do with it. And uh, so this was one of those, I was just kind of off on a, curious to see what it could do about quoting from ancient texts and stuff. So I was just asked, give me references for when Jesus prayed in ancient texts. And then it started listing stuff in the New Testament. And then it started talking about uh, non-canonical or apocryphal texts as well. Um, so this is where it actually kicked out into browsing, but it um, just right now, as of end of or middle of May, um, the web browsing plugin definitely still is pretty uneven in its behavior. Uh, it frequently has timeouts or can't follow links and that sort of stuff. So it's it's still pretty limited um, in what you can do with that side of functionality, but it's. Uh, Again, not really the focus of what I wanted to talk about today. So, today what I really wanted to focus on was how to modify the response um, from ChatGPT um, so that it's not quite so... I find that the default behavior of ChatGPT does a few things. One, it's a little bit wordy. Um, also tends to do these summaries and conclusion paragraphs that are mostly just boilerplate. Um, doesn't really add anything to the information, but it just starts to feel redundant after you've used ChatGPT for a while. Um, and so I was trying to, uh, I just wanted to kind of walk through a couple conversations um, that I had with it. and. Uh, in my exper experimentation to try and get it a little more succinct. So the first thing I tried to do, and this is a typo and I realize this now, but I was trying to get it to say, don't use uh, AI, AI boilerplate. One of the things that I've noticed with ChatGPT is uh, you, it's very much a garbage in, garbage out kind of system where you need to really craft and be clear in your prompts in order to get a good quality output. So this is a bad example of a prompt um, where I wasn't really clear about exactly what I wanted. So ChatGPT tried to understand, trying to understand this command, which didn't make a huge amount of sense, said, "Oh, I, it it thought I was being I wanted something less formal." So this is where it changed its language into something more conversational, which maybe is what you want, but that's not what I was looking for. So I said, no, you misunderstood. I prefer the formal language. I don't want the, as an AI, I am preamble and summaries book into your responses. Um, so then it said, understood, I'll keep responses formal and direct without unnecessary introductions or summaries. P please feel free to ask your next question. So again, um, you know, it, it might make for more readable text um, for just a casual reader, but if you're trying to use ChatGPT as a tool, getting rid of that boilerplate I find really makes the information easier to sort of digest and, and work with. So then, one of the first tips that I'll give, I guess, is um, when trying to craft a good quality prompt, one of the best tools in your drawer uh, is to ask ChatGPT to craft it for you. So in this question, um, now that I was happy that the response definitely was a lot shorter, to the point, uh, I asked it for future conversations, how shall I, how can I instruct you uh, with the first prompt so you communicate in this fashion? And so it said, in your first prompt, you can simply specify your preference for communication style. So here's an example of how you can instruct me. Please provide information in a direct formal style without preambles or summaries. 
Um, this will help you understand your preferences right from the start, and I will aim to respond in a way that aligns with your instructions. Excellent. So that became the start of a exercise in trying to craft initialization prompting that quickly gets me to what type of responses it is that I'm personally looking for. Um, so, uh, oh, <laughs> and I don't know if you're interested in just kind of, there's a lot of weir weirdness in interacting with a tool like ChatGPT, I find, um, in that. In some ways, it's very much like having a conversation with another human. Um, and in other ways, it's very much a machine tool. Um, I finished the uh, little book um, that Stephen Wolfram wrote called, uh, I believe it's, What is ChatGPT and How Does It Work? Roughly, or something like that. Um, and really, under the covers, what it's doing is a lot of vector math. Um, and, and it's all math, really, under the covers. Uh, and it's just, all it's doing is essentially predicting word by word or token by token, which so, sometimes it's a partial word. Um, it generates what the most likely next word is going to be every time it's adding a word to its response. So it doesn't understand the full context even of its response that it says. It's not, there isn't a sort of a conscious understanding of this. I always try and ask it questions when it does something that I've I don't understand. And even though, again, there's no sort of consciousness there, what you're doing when you're crafting a prompt is essentially creating an, a sort of an attack vector, like a vector of your, your words can be, gets converted by ChatGPT into essentially a big multi-dimensional vector of numbers. And the, sort of the shape of that array and its values dictate sort of the type of information you're going to get out of ChatGPT. So I find that, you know, if you ask interesting questions, you're going to get interesting responses, generally. There are definitely limitations. Um, for instance, it can't do logic. Um, it can't do math very well. Uh, it's frequently wrong with math questions. But that's because it's a different type of thinking, I guess. Uh, it might be a way to sort of describe it. That when you're dealing with creative word creation, so essays, uh, and paragraphs and that sort of stuff. That seems to be a different way, a different part of the brain than the part that does math. Um, and it's really good at the part for forming language. It's not great at doing math and logic and, and sort of breaking down a system into processes. But if there are examples of steps and instructions that has been fed into its training, it can sort of build off of that. Um, Fascinating stuff, and I, I don't want to get too far off the track here of what I'm trying to talk about, but uh, maybe for a future video I'll, I'll talk more in depth about the, uh, the details. But what I was doing here was I asked, why did you add please to the example? Um, you don't require that word to understand the instruction. So it's responded, you're correct. The word please isn't necessary for me to understand the instruction. I included it as an example of polite language, but it's entirely optional. Here's the instructions without. Provide information in a direct formal style without preambles or summaries. So there. Uh, nice, simple paragraph, a simple sentence. The instruction is equally clear and I will understand and follow it just as well. Helpful. And this was just where I started to ask, well, why did you default to a politely format example? And this is where it got the, as an eight. This is another piece of boilerplate that I, Again, these sort of, as an AI qualifiers, either at the beginning or ending of its responses, and it does this quite a bit. In fact, you can see down here, this it's uses again. I can understand the reason why it's in there, especially for new users, it's a good reminder, but once you're familiar with the system, you understand its limitations and abilities. Um, at least personally, I find I don't want that language in there because it just, again, just sort of clutters up the response and, uh, you know, <laughs> For purely practical purposes, that it's these are every word or word segment is a token, and you have a limited number of tokens in a conversation. So you can only have, and this is one of the key diff limitations of ChatGPT right now, is that um, I think you're limited to roughly six, seven thousand words. Um, so you know, uh, an essay kind of length of conversation in the com in the overall conversation. So every token that you, that it's wasting creating boilerplate that's not useful for me. Um, is a token that I don't have as part of the conversation. Now, that said, I don't think I've created a conversation yet where I've come up against that limit. 
I tend to, but a lot of that's because I consciously am aware of it and I try to, I tend to keep my, I tend to start a new conversation every time I want to kind of go off on a tangent. I was kind of curious about how, uh, why it was using this polite language. Um, and it says, I'm pro programmed to respond, promote respectful and polite communication. This is reflected in the examples I provide. However, your point is well taken, and I understand that in certain contexts, such as providing an example of an instruction, it may be more appropriate to use a direct format. Thank you for your feedback. So again, uh, it's programmed to be respectful and polite. Um, and then I asked, does this feedback get included into your model of future queries? And it says, I don't have the ability to remember um, individual interactions or learn from specific conversations. Each conversation with me doesn't influence future ones, and I don't have the ability to store personal data from one conversation to the next unless it's within the same conversation. My responses are generated based on a mixture of licensed data, data created by human trainers, and publicly available data, and I'm designed to respect user privacy and confidentiality. As of my knowledge cut off in September 2021, user feedback doesn't directly influence the model's responses in future queries. So if you have more questions or need further information, feel free to ask. So then I ask, well, if user feedback doesn't directly influence your model, why did you thank me for my feedback? The phrase, thank you for your feedback, is often used as a polite acknowledgement of the information or opinion someone has shared. While I, as an AI, cannot personally learn or adapt from feedback in the traditional sense, the statement expresses an understanding and acknowledgement of the points you've raised. It's a way to convey that your input has been heard and understood within the context of the current conversation. I hope this clarifies the matter. If you have further questions, feel free to ask. So this is where I was trying to get rid of the as an AI formality. Um, this took a little bit of prompting too. So stop using the as an AI formality. Understand you are an AI. You do not need to keep reminding me. Understood, your circumstances have been noted. How may I assist you further? So again, if you're unfamiliar with ChatGPT, you can customize its responses within any conversation. It won't carry those conversational adjustments on to any new conversation you have with it, but Within a conversation, I mean, you can customize and tailor what's going on between you and your chat GPT you know, responses um, to get something more quality to what it is that you're looking for. And again, kind of the purpose of this video is to talk about what are some prompts that you can start a conversation off with that will get it to a more collaborative, information dense response. Efficiency, I guess, is what I'm trying to seek here. How can I prompt you in new conversations so that you don't use an AI as an AI in addition to my first request? So here's where it says you could specify your preferences with your initial instruction. You can start the conversation with provide information in a direct formal style without preamble summaries or stating as an AI. This will guide the communication style used throughout the conversation. And I said, thank you. And I said, you're welcome. If you have any other questions in the future, don't hesitate to ask. Um, and again, I, I just seem to, I can't help but go off on a little bit of tangent when it says something that I'm, you know, we were just talking about politeness and it was saying it was basically being trained that way. And so I was curious to see what it thought when I said, when I used politeness, thank you. Um, why did you think I thanked you when I know you are an AI? So it says, while I don't have feelings or consciousness, the act of saying thank you is a common social norm in human communication. It's often used to express acknowledgement or satisfaction with the information or service provided, regardless of whether the provider is a human or a machine. This convention can help maintain a respectful and positive atmosphere in the conversation. Um, your use of thank you signals the end of this particular line of inquiry or conversation is appreciated for its role in facilitating clear communication. So this last sentence in particular I found kind of useful um, because by... I've definitely found that my own personal style when talking with ChatGPT is to not treat it like a person. So I don't tend to use uh, polite language. I just tend to be very direct and instructional um, because it's a tool. It's not a person, except when I'm trying to get it to actually respond. Like I said, when I'm trying to understand its thinking. Um, again, it's not thinking in a sort of a traditional sense, but um, it can use its own model and language generating tools to explain how those language generating tools work to some degree. So anyway, I found that was interesting now and I definitely will use thank you as a conversation ender when I want to move on to the next thing. So again, it's a clear communication. Sometimes polite language like thank you um, is has a function as well. Um, so anyway, I just found that kind of interesting myself.
Uh, but it respond its response required another request um, because here, while I don't have feelings of consciousness, so again, I know it's an AI. I don't need it to tell me that it doesn't have feelings of consciousness because I'm aware that it doesn't. Um, so even though I told it not to use stating as an AI uh, in the request, it literally was only going to limit itself to as an AI, where really what I was trying to do was get it to get rid of all boilerplate. So this is where I started to kind of dig in more about, you know, again, one of the challenges in using ChatGPT is not knowing what you can ask or how you can, or what it is that you actually want. Trying to figure out what it is that you want is almost sort of the first step before you can start getting ChatGPT to do it for you. But again, this is where having a conversational language generating tool is handy, is that often you can ask ChatGPT to help you figure out what it is that you want. So here, you know, uh, I said I had intended to end that part of the conversation, but again, uh, your response requires another request. List all the boilerplate responses such as, as an AI, and while I don't have feelings or consciousness, you are trained, uh, that you are trained to use in your responses to prompts. And again, I'm glad it's not a stickler for grammar and not stru uh, stru uh, sentence structure. Uh, what term describes all of them? So this, again, I didn't, I'm trying to understand how to create a, uh, a overreaching term so I can use it in a prompt. So again, these types of phrases are often referred to as canned responses or predefined responses. They are phrases that are designed to be used in a variety of different situations to provide clear and concise information or to handle frequently encountered queries or scenarios. They are not unique to AI systems and are often used in customer service, in automatic email replies, and other similar contexts. As for a comprehensive list of such phrases I might use, it's challenging to provide one because my responses are generated dynamically based on the input provided the context of the conversation and the vast amount of information I was trained on. However, here are some examples of the types of phrases you're asking about. As an AI, while I don't have feelings of consciousness, I'm trained on a mixture of licensed data, data created by human trainers and publicly available data. I don't have the ability to remember individual interactions. I don't have access to personal data, but individual individuals and lists have been shared with me in the course of our conversation. So again, one nice, gives me a nice range of boilerplate text, but it also gave me uh, canned response and predefined responses, so that's my terminology that I'm looking for. So these are used to set accurate expectations about what I can do, clarify how I work, and ensure users are aware of privacy and data handling practices. They're important for transparency and user understanding. Uh, so I said, add the ability to turn these off to my prompt request. So now it modified its prompt request again. Uh, so we already had this part, staying as an AI, and then it added, or using explanatory canned responses. Uh, and it added a nice little clarification. However, please note that while I strive to follow user preferences, there may still be instances where these types of phrases could be used, especially if they are crucial for understanding, context, or privacy-related reasons. If you see them being used and you feel it's unnecessary, feel free to let me know during the conversation. So again, excellent. Um, I said thank you again, and end the that part of the conversation, and then I went on to the next thing. So then I went to my next, my, in my next chat, I started with, that boilerplate, uh, although I got rid of the as an AI because it was uh, duplicate. Again, let me go back here for a second. Um, right, so it, adding in that filter, it left in this one, which is really the first stab at trying to get it to stop using this. So I just took that part out and replaced it uh, in my next prompt. But let's go back to that prompt. So again, here, so now I have provide information in direct formal style without preamble summaries or using Explorer or explanatory can responses. Um, and then I just asked a question. So this one I says, what should I remember when trying to get you to write quality code? Um, and so there's a nice sort of six point list of, because uh, I'm using it to generate software uh, as well as just generating text. Um, again, I'm kind of trying to learn all the different ways you can use ChatGPT and, and it's, and really its applications um, are boundless in many ways. Um, so, you know, I'm always adding new ideas and new tools to my sort of chest of, of, uh, of things I can bring into using uh, instead of ChatGPT. Okay, um, so I couldn't find the rest of the conversation where I get added the next two sections, but maybe I just did this on my own afterwards. But here's an example of where I've sort of landed with my sort of, I guess I could call it prompt boilerplate so the first one I kind of already covered where it's 
I just wanted nice, clean, well, again, direct formal style without preamble summaries or using explanatory canon responses. So that kind of filters out all the filler in the response. A couple of other things that I've noticed with ChatGPT is it often, if your prompt lacks detail, by default, it seems like it will make its best guess. So here's a sort of where I finally landed with my prompting boilerplate. I've just got about four lines highlighted here. Let me kind of review them one at a time again. Uh, so the first one, I think I've already covered this basically. But the next thing that I realized is by default, ChatGPT seems to, um, if, if you don't have enough clarity in your prompt, um, it will by default make sort of a best guess at what it thinks you want and then give you an answer based on that which sometimes is good and sometimes it's not so but what i asked it next was if you need clarification ask before forming us wrongs so that one will get it to instead of just kind of making that a leap to an assumption it'll in its response it'll actually say well here's what i'm missing or can you give me some more information uh, about this particular thing uh, and this second, this third line is sort of like a follow-up to that one, because uh, one is maybe I'm vague. This third line is more about maybe I'm missing information. I'm not necessarily vague, but I'm just missing detail. So here if I say, if my prompt lacks detail, list the details that are missing, organized by category and hierarchy. So now this does two things again. So it if it it lists what's missing, what it's looking for. Um, and it also organizes all of that by category hierarchically. Um, and the last one came up where by default, it tries to sort of do everything from scratch. If it, but because it's been fed, you know, almost, you know, a pretty wide cross section of human knowledge, it should be aware of no matter what the subject context is, um, what are sort of common best practices, existing models is what it is the term that I got it to kind of give me. Um, and again, I used another sort of prompt crafting querying with it to say, how can you, uh, I, I essentially started with, uh, I don't want you inventing everything from whole cloth. Um, how do I get you to use something that, if there's something that's, for a particular task that's sort of common practice or like best in show kind of thing, use that. And if there's choices, give me options. So that's where, and then I got it to refine that question into a simplified short prompt that I could use. And so that's where I got use existing models, give clear options for me to choose. So that, so these four combined give me a very different type of response. Um, even if I give it a very simple um, statement here. So I didn't put a lot of detail into the actual query. I want to create a Svelte and Firebase application that can host my organization's website. So I didn't say what the website was, what we were trying to do. I just said, here's two technologies. This is what I want to do. So now it gave me, here's what I need in the following categories. So project scope, what features do you want in your website? And gave me some examples. What kind of content will be hosted? Again, more examples. Is there a desired look and feel for the website? Again, uh, what is the estimated number of users or level of traffic expected? All excellent questions as far as scope. Firebase services. Which services are you planning to use? Firestore, Firebase authentication, Firebase hosting. Um, do you have specific requirements for data security and privacy? Both excellent questions. Good starting points. Svelte knowledge and experience. What's your current level of expertise in Svelte? Excellent. Do you need a step-by-step -step guide or just an overview? Again, excellent question. Sort of a good starting points to get me thinking about, okay, here's what you need to know about me and my what are, where I'm coming from. That will help it understand what it needs to help me with. And then finally, deployment and maintenance. How do you plan to deploy and host the website? Who will maintain the website post-development? Again, all good sort of starting questions. And I'm sure there's a lot more, but this just by answering all of these will get me a long way towards sort of the next set of questions. And then it gave me some options at the end. Choose the options that best fit your requirements. Beginner friendly guide, step-by-step -step guide to building a Svelte and Firebase application from scratch. Suitable for beginners or those new to Svelte and Firebase. Advanced guide, a more detailed guide for those who already have experience with Svelte and Firebase. This will not cover basic topics, but will dive deeper into best practices and advanced features. 
or an overview guide, a high-level overview of how to integrate Svelte and Firebase, suitable for experienced developers who are familiar with both technologies. See, that's a. If I hadn't have gotten these four parts in here, I would have gotten a very different response with a lot more sort of vagueness. I don't think I would have gotten nearly the amount of questions here. So, anyway, that's kind of just my my sort of power tip for the day. I guess is if you're looking to, and I'll put this in my description in this video when I post on YouTube. Um, but just by adding these four statements to the beginning of any ChatGPT conversation uh, will greatly enhance sort of the quality of what you get back and, and help you improve your prompt quality and add data that it needs, the relevant information that it can use to help further the conversation in a constructive way. If you're new, if you're like me and playing around with this stuff, I wanted to share those four statements as a sort of a prompt engineering uh, tools that to uh, help you get better quality responses in ChatGPT. Okay, that's it for today. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time.